So we're in chapter six tonight of Acts. And I've done this a little bit different than last week. I don't have my questions embedded, but I've got some interesting discussion to go on with it. So we'll start with the beginning there. Now, in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there also arose a complaint among the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the work of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we, we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And of course, because I clicked off into Zoom, it didn't advance my slide. So there we go. Are you seeing a yellow highlighted yes. text? Okay, good. So it's working. So right off the bat, we start off with two different problems. The first problem is the one that they vocalized, and that is that the Hellenistic Jews, those that were Greek, this could be either those who were from the outside provinces that were coming there for Pentecost itself, or it could be those Hellenistic Jews who had relocated to Jerusalem because they were retired and they were being excluded from the food distribution to the widows. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, they were looking to the apostles to be the one to deal with the problem. And as they pointed out, that's not a good thing because that means they'd be leaving God's work or leaving working in the word with the people to be doing a physical kind of work. The solution is that they get seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And key to that is looking at the issue of the Holy Spirit. So it said full of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter four, verses one through six. This is where we get a little bit more about what's going on with the Holy Spirit. And in particular, this is the passage where it talks about there being one body, one spirit, as well as there being one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. All right. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost kind of thing, you run into an issue. The first issue that you tend to run into is what I just verbally said out loud. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, or your Holy Ghost, depending on your translation. What I just said is usually referred to as tritheism, meaning three gods that act as one. There's a little bit of a problem with that because of what we have there in verse 6 one God. And it's not as big a problem as some have made it out to be. Um, this actually caused some significant division. It's considered to be a heretical belief as far as the three God belief system because of Ephesians chapter four, verse six, that there's only one God. The way that you can understand that, or oh, I guess I should say, the way I'm going to muddy that up even more <laughs> is because we have the passage over in Genesis where it talks about two becoming one. When you have a husband and wife, the two become one flesh. So we have an example right within scripture where you have two different entities, the husband and the wife, becoming one. Using that concept, you could say that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one, and they are God. That's 
working then into the idea of um, the Trinity, where you have three, they have distinct function, but they are one. The truth is, I can't give you an absolute answer on this. Part of the problem is because our concept of God, our concept of God is based out of Greek mythology and other things like that, where we tend to humanize God, and that's putting God into way too small a package. So it's something that we do the best we can with what we have, but we know in the Old Testament that in Genesis, actually, when it talks about in the creation, let us let us make man in our own image. That us is a plural. So the implication is that there was more than one present at the time of creation. And if you were to try to break down creation as far as the different functions, God the Father would be the one giving direction saying, let there be light. The one that gave order and structure in creation would be the Son, the Logos. And the one that would give life would be the Spirit, and potentially give power would also be the Spirit. So you have those three distinct functions, but here's the other part of why I go back to the Genesis chapter 2 example of two becoming one. In, in verse four, um, yeah, in verse four of Ephesians chapter four, it says there's one body and one spirit. The one body it's talking about is the church. However, if we're looking at the way this passage is structured, the one spirit is talking about the one spirit that inhabits the body, the church. There is one spirit that the whole body of Christ consists of. It's not a bunch of different spirits. It's the spirit of God that indwells each one of us, but it's that one spirit. So we are each individuals. We are part of one body. We each have the spirit of God within us. It's not like we're cutting it up into itty bitty pieces. And I'm not sure if I'm really being clear about this, but then again, this isn't a totally clear concept. <clears throat> Does anybody have any thoughts right now or am I really just confusing everybody? All's quiet. Okay. Well, I don't have any. I don't have anything to add other than the fact, like I said, is uh, it, it it can get confusing uh, sometimes when you when it. Ah, uh, well, I don't know. It just gets confusing. Yeah, and if I had a problem with it myself when I was younger, because when I would look at scripture. God, the Father, I had no question that he was God. The Son of God doesn't know all that the Father knows. So there's a difference in the distinction. And there were people that would say there's only one God and that God, the Father, is God, the Son, is God, the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't see that because how could the Son not know everything if the son and the father were the same so there's definitely a distinction right there as far as what the father knows what the son knows the other distinction that we have is when jesus left the earth and we're going to see that in a bit uh, from john the spirit was being given but it could only be given after Jesus had departed. And we find throughout the Old Testament, um, the spirit of God as a phrase that gets used. 
And unfortunately, even that can be confusing because the expression of, it could be taking, taken two different ways. It could be taken as a part of God or an association with God, such as um, the wife of Joe is Linda. That doesn't mean that Linda is a physical part of Joe that we ripped out and separated. <clears throat> it means that she is in association with Joe and she is his wife. The wife of Joe is Linda. But it doesn't mean that they're the same being. Whereas if you take part of me and cut it off... <laughs> You would actually have part of me. <coughs> you would have a situation where you would have to take a piece of me away when you're talking about my hand is a part of my body. That hand is actually a physical attached to part that were you to separate it out, you've actually lessened me because you've taken my hand away and i don't think that's what it's talking about when it says uh spirit of god i think that what we see here in ephesians chapter four is the concept of the unity of the spirit and the oneness of the spirit that that's a manifestation of who we are based on what we are striving to be, but also based on God's imparting it to us. Um, again, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear with this. Having, we all have a spirit. And that spirit is unique to each and every one of us. Or maybe I'm saying that, or I'm sorry. I, I just then thought about spirit versus soul. We all have spirit. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Each one of us is a spirit that has an external body to it. If you want to think about the word spirit in that respect, it's better to think of the spirit as the generic and the soul as the specific. My soul is distinct, is what makes me distinct spiritually from Robert. Robert's got a spirit. What makes him or what is uniquely him is his soul. Um, the word soul is a noun spirit can be both noun or um i want to say adjective in so far as it is our life force it is what and the dog's talking okay <laughs> that's not my dog <laughs> okay maybe that's somebody's that's dog that's nano's dog that's nano's dog okay it was either that or somebody somebody was growling really loud um, uh, so when we're talking spirit and soul, the soul is a noun and it is a distinct entity, whereas the spirit, it tends to function more like an adjective. It can be talking about like team spirit, which is sort of what we're talking about here, but not at that mundane level. A spirit that permeates throughout <coughs> and in this case the one spirit is the spirit that permeates throughout the body however as you see in verse three endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit we might be all working with that same spirit but if we're not working in unity then we've got a problem <coughs> we can look at the fruit of the spirit and recognize that each aspect that we see in the fruit of the spirit can be functional without working with it in unity. So 
Uh, I'm sorry. This is a complex <laughs> topic and I'm probably not doing a good job at cleaning it up. The long and the short of what I was trying to cover with this part is that when it comes to understanding the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there are a couple of ideas out there. To think of each as God isn't as heretical as some would profess because we have the concept in Genesis 2 where the two become one. I can see that easily being applied to the three being one and acting as one. So in that respect, you have one God. The place where you have a problem with that a little bit is right there in Ephesians 4 verse 6, when it makes the attachment between one God and Father of all, the distinction then being that God the Father is the full embodiment of God. God the Son, which evidently knows less than the Father because he does not know when the final day will be, only the Father knows that is potentially a entity being, however you want to call that, that has been with God since the beginning of time, but is distinct from God the Father. The same would go for the Spirit as well. It has been with God the Father since the beginning of time. And by being in that close association both would be able to be representative of God, representative of God, because of their consistent association with God. The distinction being, the Son came down to this world, was exposed to sin in a way that the Father will never be exposed to it. God, the Father, cannot know sin. So, in that respect. The son became different from the father when he came down to this world. The same thing would be true of the spirit. That when the spirit in the Old Testament, and then we have it after baptism in the New Testament more specifically, is a part of this world, that makes the spirit distinct from the father as well. There's an interesting book that's a little bit on the deep side that was written by C.S. Lewis called The Problem of Pain. And he goes into the concept that I was just describing there, that the oneness of the Father, Son, and Spirit that existed prior to creation would make them all almost the exact same, except that they were three separate beings. The distinction truly comes after creation when the spirit and the son have a more direct part within the creation itself. So I'm sorry I ran deep with this. It's not an easy topic. The nature of God, we can't really know because all we have in scripture is the best communication you can give to man about a concept that's so far beyond man it sure Any, is yeah <laughs> and put it together in a in a way that makes it easy for me I, okay. I look at it that that god is the architect christ is the contractor and the holy spirit is the operating force that carries out the the wishes that's an excellent analogy. Yes, that is. Um, it keeps all three distinct. They're working in the same process and the same function as far as they're out to have the building produced, but they're functioning in different aspects and potentially all three functioning with the full authority of God. But yes, that was a great analogy. Any other thoughts? Because there's another aspect to the spirit that's a bit easier to hit on that we're going to get covered in just a moment as well that relates to both um, Acts and then back into John. 
Okay. Moving forward a little bit then, Acts 6, 5 through 7. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, that is um, that they should be selecting the seven men that were full of the Spirit and good works. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, the cool part is, after having stated what those two problems were in verses 1 through 4, we now have what happens when that problem gets resolved when the apostles are again able to better focus on the word and spreading the word while others are focusing on service the word of god spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly and this is important because of what we've been discussing well i guess discussing may not be the right word it's come up a couple of times and that is the jobs that there are to do within the church. The more people become involved, the better we operate as a body. And the better we operate as a body, that's when God's word is going to succeed and spread and be more effective. When you have one area trying to do too much and other areas not doing anything, that's a dysfunctional body. If I tried to operate with only my right arm and my right leg, I'm going to look pretty silly hopping around. And the same is true for the body of Christ. When everybody works together, it looks more natural. It looks righter because that's what we expect. We expect to see a functional organization. And when it's not functioning that way, even the world recognizes something's a little bit messed up. Now, here's where we hit on the next aspect of the spirit. Then, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, that Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. Full of faith and power did great wonders and signs. But that's not where the spirit is associated with Stephen. It's not down until verse 10, where it says, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And this is important because unfortunately, a lot of times when people think about the Holy Spirit being imparted at baptism, some of the people, Pentecostals, take a look at that first part up there where it says full of faith and power. And they say, ah, there you go. He's got power. That's the spirit. And he did great signs and wonders. That's why you got to speak in tongues. That's why you've got to have the miraculous manifestation. Except verse eight doesn't reference the spirit. It's verse 10, the wisdom <laughs> and the spirit by which he spoke. This is consistent with what we know from John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11, where it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. 
of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged, referring to Satan. So when it says in verse 10, the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, the spirit is to convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It's to give that fuller understanding that while we can read scripture and gain a head knowledge, head knowledge is not the same thing as conviction. And it's notice, it's conviction of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. The world can read the Bible and not be convicted of it. The world can read the Bible and have no part in the spirit of God. The spirit is the aspect which convicts of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So when we're looking at what took place with Stephen, what they could not refute was both the wisdom and the spirit. So the raw knowledge, wisdom, and its application but also associated with that is the spirit that gave understanding of the conviction of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And <clears throat> we also know at another time in scripture, and I didn't get this one up there, where we're told that God was, or that the spirit would give them the words they needed in times of trial and so forth. And again, it wasn't because they were going to outsmart those that were persecuting them it was going to give them the right words of conviction about sin righteousness and judgment that maybe they wouldn't be able to piece it together as quickly themselves but the spirit was the one that was going to give that extra nudge so when we're talking about acts and we're talking about the holy spirit to point to the speaking in tongues and to point to the miraculous, essentially, we've got to almost push aside the distinction that we see made here in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Because while God is giving witness to the teaching through power, through wonders, through signs, that's not the part of the spirit that Stephen himself has. The part of the spirit that is within Stephen is the part we see here in verse 10, where it is both wisdom and the spirit by which Stephen is speaking. And the part we've got to also keep in mind is you don't get or grow in the spirit unless you're growing in wisdom and understanding of God's word. Because the first half of verse 10, I believe, is critical for the second half to be there. Stephen wasn't somebody who just got up and spouted something. Stephen was a man who had knowledge and wisdom based on God's word. He had extra because of the spirit that was within him. And Robert or Joe or Boone, do you all have some extra thoughts on this? Well, I think by the disciples laying their hands on it departed some gifts that you know was needed for the work that they were performing. Right. And my feeling is, is that this just wrote, goes to prove that aspect of you know passing on those gifts to Stephen that you he, you know that he showed that he was full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the, the people. And that was just to confirm, you know, the, the disciples laying on of the hands. Right. Those gifts. 
That's a great point to bring up because if you look at the use of the Spirit of God throughout the Old Testament, and fact is that's where Spirit of God only exists as far as a phrase uh, is in the Old Testament. The thing you find consistently in the Old Testament was when they recognized the Spirit of God within a person, it was because they saw the power, they saw something being manifest. That's different and distinct from what Jesus talks about in John 16. He's not talking about an outward manifestation. He's talking about an inward conviction and understanding. And that is what we need relative to our service in the body of Christ. The miraculous gifts and so forth were very beneficial at the time of Pentecost and beyond because they gave witness in a way that was hard to refute. However, without the aspect that relates to God's word, you can have all the miraculous signs in the world that's not going to show anybody God's plan of salvation. It's not going to convict anybody of their sin and their need for a savior. It's not going to communicate to us what truly is an act of righteousness versus going through the motions and doing right things. Uh, Richard, I also think, I also think of the, the verse 10 uh, points out that, you know, what you say sometimes is important, but how you say it is even more important, if not more important than what you're saying. And uh, uh, if you don't speak things with, with, uh, with um, in a way, so like I've talked to you before about, you know, you can tell when somebody's uh, doing something because they're just in the court for the money or if they're they truly believe it and 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 do it and and that's part of them. And if you don't speak and teach that way, you know, having the wisdom really don't do you a whole lot of good unless you can present it in a way that uh, that uh, the person actually sees that you believe from your heart what you're preaching and teaching to them. Yep. Yeah, and you're right to point out verse ten because that expounds on righteousness and why it was important that the spirit be imparted we can look at scripture be, the same way the apostles could have looked at scripture as far as the old testament and found acts of righteousness that are recorded in the scripture that god identifies as righteous and we don't have that going on today in our current environment all we have is the past examples. We have different things as far as health, different things as far as needs and so forth. I mean, the physical needs of food and shelter, that's the same. The culture that we're in is different than the culture of the New Testament, is different than the culture of the Old Testament recognizing righteousness the way jesus did because jesus had to tell the pharisees and sadducees you're looking at it all wrong because you're missing the point healing a person on the sabbath is not the problem when somebody is made whole when somebody who's made in the image of god is healed that's always a good thing you don't use your understanding of God's teaching to deny God's rightness. We don't have Jesus here to draw that line in the sand today. That's where we need to have the knowledge. We need to have the understanding, but we need to have the spirit, I believe, to further show us what it means to be acting in the will of God. And I made a statement Sunday as far as prayer goes, that we pray for answers in prayer, but it takes 
an open uh, open mind that was going to be go the wrong direction it takes a mind that has been enlightened by scripture but is also aware to understand the answers that it receives last year around this time i was fasting and my prayer was okay god what exactly is the direction i'm supposed to be going in that was my prayer that was my fast Throughout the fast, the answer I received from God on an almost daily basis was, don't worry, I will take care of you. And I had to chuckle about it because I understood by the end of my fast that my question was the wrong question to be asking, and God was giving me the answer I needed at that time. Most recently, my question was along those same lines again, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And the answer I got was, don't worry, I will keep you busy. And again, it was one of those almost daily things where I was fasting and I was praying. And the answer I was consistently getting was, don't worry, here's something else I need you to do. Don't worry, here's something else I need you to do. And we don't get those kind of answers often because one, we don't earnestly seek God enough in prayer with fasting. We sort of set fasting aside, but I sometimes think we're looking for our answers so strongly that we're quenching the spirit. We're denying the opportunity for God to answer our prayers when if we would just take the time to say, okay, this is what I'm praying for and stop and listen and watch and see what answer we're actually being given. I think that's when we have the opportunity to learn a lot more than the answer to my prayer was, well, I didn't get the answer to my prayer. I got the answer I needed both times. I think that the awareness of what is right in my life at each of those times wasn't about here's the answer that you're going to read in scripture but also at the same time wasn't a here's the voice from heaven telling me here's the writing on the wall it was the experience i was getting again and again and again that i recognized i'm going to god for an answer the answer he's giving me is to a different question. I believe that is what it's talking about here in verses 8, 9, and 10. That the righteousness revealed from God, when we seek God's answer in prayer, and when I say that, I don't mean, am I taking this job or am I taking that job? I mean more along the lines of, okay, if I'm to be following in your will, what is it I should be seeking to do right now? And if it's job influence, then let me know. But when we make it something more mundane, almost like that magic eight ball where you flip it over. Okay, the answer is it's cloudy right now. Come back later. No, 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 no. That's not what we're told to be about. If we are, as we saw in Acts with the disciples, with the apostles, people in God's word, people of God's word, that when we go seeking an answer to prayer, we're not looking for a worldly answer. We're looking for a godly answer. It becomes easier to be receptive to the answer of, okay, this is what's holding you back and I'm making it rather obvious for you because it's not necessarily sin that can be the only thing that can hold us back. If we're overly committed in our lives to our jobs, he can make that painfully obvious to us as to what is holding us back when we're overly committed to our jobs. Uh, the same kind of thing as far as judgment. When we are seeking an understanding of judgment might be a strong word 
but when we have to reconcile a conflict. Seeking God's understanding about how to reconcile the conflict is more than just saying, okay, scripture says this is right and this is wrong. Well, we're not going to find scriptural answers to present day conflict resolution. We can seek God's wisdom and understanding and by being open to what he will offer us, we can find out sometimes that there are deeper levels to the conflict than we understood it initially when all we were looking for is what's the answer. Sometimes the answer to the conflict is this person is suffering with this other issue. Deal with the other issue and the conflict all of a sudden disappears because they were stressed out. They weren't dealing well with life in general. And how you're seeing that manifest is in this current conflict where they can't get over the color of the carpet not being blue. Deal with their real problem, and they don't care about the color of the carpet. I believe that's how the of judgment refers to. That sort of a mix of the righteousness and the judgment is the understanding that we need to be able to resolve issues in a godly way when we're taking the time to approach God in prayer, asking for his understanding and looking at it with eyes that are fresh, that are looking to see, okay, what is God telling me in this conflict situation? What do I need to be able to address that may not be what appears to be the obvious of what's going wrong? Um, when I did this in the college course, they did a, we did a conflict resolution situation as our final project in class that was a simulated conflict between five, four brothers, one sister with a minister and an elder being involved with the resolution process. And what I heard in two of the people in that conflict was in one case, the person's concept of legacy. The person was minorly, um, mentally no longer fully functional because of diabetes. What they were only able to focus on was the legacy of their parents. That when you address their issue of legacy, not necessarily resolving the problem, but address their concern, all of a sudden, that person was no longer a problem in the equation. Another person's issues were that their wife was recently diagnosed with a certain type of cancer. And again, when you address their concern over cancer, all of a sudden that person was no longer a problem as far as the conflict went as the big picture. That's true to life. When you start to recognize what people's needs truly are in the conflict the big conflict sometimes dissolves into nothing i think we are better able to accomplish that when god's spirit is working in us thoughts to me i think that conflict is similar to an overwhelming uh, of issues and I think that what you need to do again is, is break it down, put your blinders on and just deal with one issue at a time. And then over a period of time, the entire issues become null and void. You know, it can wear you out. Yep. Thinking about all the problems that people have. Um, it can wear them out and also it can wear the, the minister out as well too. Right. Uh, because you start getting um, invested in it and sometimes you have to listen but keep a, 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 a I would say a safe distance uh, right. from getting too involved. Right. Well, and Okay, that's part of my class. 
the elder and the minister aren't there to fix the problems. They're there to facilitate the discussion because the brothers and the sister were the ones that had to come to a resolution that they could all work with. When an elder or a minister attempts to put the answer onto the problem, that just puts a target on us. <laughs> and that can take you down faster than I don't know what. So, yeah. Well, I think Richard is too, <clears throat> like Joe said, it's important that you, you, know, you need them to let, let them see what the problem is themselves, but you got to deal with one issue before you move on to the other, because if you don't resolve the sub issue, the you're not going to, it's still going to be there and you're not going to be able to resolve the issue. And, and so you can get one piece at a time and leave them to, to see that uh, what they should do and not tell them what to do. And if, 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 you know, it doesn't tell it do anything good to tell a person what to do unless they can see the purpose and, and come make that decision themselves. That's what you need to do. And right. uh, hopefully that's what you do in most cases. Is, uh, just uh, you know, uh, study with someone and and and, and uh, counsel them till they come to the conclusion based on the discussion what they really need to do in their heart. And and, and uh, but uh, I, I think it's really important what the point Joe made though is to uh, break it down into sub element and, and work up to accomplishing. But you can't accomplish it all at one time. It's, uh, it's got to be a process to go through. Yeah. And my addition or my tie back to what we're saying here is that we can accomplish it better when we're working with God's spirit. And because we have right there in verse eight, part of his purpose is to convict us of righteousness and of judgment. And that includes in conflict resolution. We go back to verse six, Richard, and said, uh, when they prayed, they laid hands on them, then the word of God spread. Uh, uh, the, uh, speak on the, the laying of the hands uh, uh, as being part of the process. Is that part of the process? Um, okay, that's a twofold question because this is not the only passage that talks about praying and laying on of hands. Right. Uh, the elders are told to pray and lay hands on the sick. I believe there is nothing wrong with doing it literally the way it says here. And I believe when it talks about laying on the hands on the sick, um, Paul's writing again. Uh, -dum -bum -bum. Might be even to Timothy. But twofold it's one thing to pray for a person it's another thing to lay hands on and pray for the person yeah adding that physical aspect to it i believe adds a greater level of um conviction to the individual who's being prayed for um, it makes it a tactile as well as mental experience. I believe that the tactile imparts, I'm not saying this in a miraculous way. I'm saying that people respond to touch. Yes, they and, do. And so when it says that they're laying on hands for those that they're praying for, when they're set, when they're appointing these deacons, um, it's another way of conveying to the person that we're with you. The apostles aren't just saying, okay, we're setting you up. Good luck. See ya. They understand for us to continue our work. Your work is important. And we are praying to God. We are taking this before the throne of God. And we are taking you before the throne of God in prayer. Um, what would you like to add? I think that the laying on of hands at this point isn't a formula that makes it better as far as, well, if you don't lay the hands on part, then God's going to leave that piece out. I don't believe that's what we see taking place here. However, I definitely am not opposed to the idea of laying on of hands when you appoint deacons. 
uh, appointing elders, laying on the hands as far as of the sick and so forth. I think all of that's good practice. I don't think that this is a command. I think this is only an example. I don't know if I cleared up the question, though. I can tell you that the example that's given of uh, the elders going and praying for the sick and anointing them with oil, that really works. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had several examples of that. I've even used it when I was visited with uh, people uh, in the hospital uh, with the legion. And uh, if nothing else, it really, it really encourages not only the individual, but the family as well. Right. Well, and okay, that one goes to a fun bit and this screws off in the wrong direction, probably. They did a study a while back, I want to say back in the late 80s, uh, about prayer. And you had the people that weren't being prayed for, and you had the people that were being prayed for. You also had a segment of the population that were being prayed for that didn't even know they were being prayed for. Those that weren't being prayed for at all, they did the worst. <laughs> those that were being prayed for but didn't know it did better than those who weren't being prayed for at all. And those that knew it were the ones that benefited the most. I believe part of what is involved with prayer isn't just the faith of the person that's saying the prayer. It's the one that's hearing and receiving and praying along with. So I believe that laying on of hands and anointing with oil takes that conviction that much farther. And we know that in James, it talks about praying without doubt. I think that when you take it all the way, as far as laying on the hands and anointing with oil, that yes, you are showing we have no doubt we are fully convicted. This is the example we found in Scripture. We're doing it Scripture's way. And I believe that, yes, you're showing your conviction before God, that you're trying to do everything in your capability to do it His way. And I believe God blesses that. Well, we're actually awfully close to the very end. And verse 13 to 15. They also set out false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of, of an angel. And blasphemy is any act or offense of speaking sacrilegiously about God or sacred things. And it can also be profane talk. So the only things that Stephen did was speak from Scripture, Old Testament wisdom, and speak with the power and the authority that the Spirit was imparting as well. The Spirit's not going to go against the Word. The Word was God's Word to man. The Word, the Old Testament, was what was preparing them for Christ. Jesus didn't come down and say the Old Testament was ever wrong. So the blasphemy that they have was that they weren't, or Stephen wasn't amening to continue to practice Old Testament when the fulfillment of the Old Testament had occurred. But that wasn't teaching against the temple, because where did they first meet? They were first meeting in the temple. So if it was the wrong kind of place, if it was a blasphemous place, then the church wouldn't have been meeting in the temple to begin with. And of course, they're referring to destroy this place, the false accusation that they had against Jesus as well. So, yep, that's what I thought. So we hit the end of the passage um, and we're up against eight o'clock. 
So any thoughts? I'm sorry if I muddied the discussion a bit on the spirit. When it comes to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Robert's description is one I've heard. I heard one similar to that where it described it like a record player, where if the three are one, you have the guidance, which is the little hole that you have in the center of your record. Then you have the plastic that is the record itself. And then you have the grooves with those itty bitty ups and downs in it that are the message. And I forgot how they broke that down in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three are aspects of the same. And that would be working with the idea that Father, Son, and Spirit are aspects of one thing. I don't believe that's an accurate analogy. I believe that Robert's analogy is far better that each has a distinct, different purpose. Same goal, but play a different part. They are one in that they are one acting towards that same final accomplishment. But while acting towards that same accomplishment, each has a distinct, different role. That they could all have been totally the same in purpose and function prior to creation. Okay, that's neither here nor there. After creation, they become very distinct because the father does not physically come down to this world. The son did. The spirit does. So at that point in time, yes, I have to amen Robert's description. They're all distinct. The other thing that I would say as far as the spirit goes, the passage from John coupled with what it says about Stephen is consistent. It's identifying what was the spirit that we received at baptism. It wasn't the miraculous part as far as the power, the wonders, etc. It is the part that we see talked about there in John. I believe that is the part we have to work with even to this day that we study, we can gain wisdom and understanding, but the one that can take us farther than that is God's spirit. And like I said, we're already past eight o'clock by about four minutes. <laughs> Any last thoughts? I'm sorry if I wasn't crystal clear. <laughs> it's a hard Fine. subject. <laughs> yes, it is. And it's one, unfortunately. It's an that, unclear one. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's one that we've avoided too much in the past. And that adds to the confusion. The spirit's function in the Old Testament is pretty clear. Uh, we see divine power. But we also see every person in which God's spirit came upon had full function, meaning they were still in control because we see it both with Saul as a negative uh, person who did wrong, the king. We also see it with, and I'm going to get his name wrong because I keep thinking Balaam, the guy who did the... Um, that was called upon to curse the Israelites by that one king, God's spirit comes on him. And the prophecy he does at the end, he does not because he went off to the side and said, okay, I got to talk to God. He just lets go and starts blessing the people, except God's spirit came upon him and he blessed the people. So there again, you have an example where God's spirit acted with man but it's, again, acting very consistently in the Old Testament. There was always an outward manifestation where they recognize God's spirit is acting with this individual. New Testament, we're talking about it in a different capacity. The outward manifestations, the powers, the wonders, the signs, etc., is not what Jesus said they were going to receive. So we talk about baptism with water, 
baptism with water and spirit. I believe Jesus was letting them know, okay, you're going to get baptized again on Pentecost and it's going to be with power and the spirit, the spirit part that's going to carry forward consistently is what we read about in John. And when we look at the Holy spirit after that, we may see as Joe pointed out different gifts, different miraculous powers, but the thing that we all get is what we read about back in John. Because the truth is, it's what we all need. We need that extra bit that helps us clarify, okay, it's not the same exact thing as what we're going to find in the Old Testament. It's not the exact thing we're going to find in the New Testament. Because we live today. Our experiences are today. God is there to help us today.